Okay, so now we have a solution that's cable-based. And uh, the gearbox is pretty much the same as I used on my first wing. Control stick is set up the same way. I got a nice uh, file handle here that I drilled out and put on the control stick. And there's the push rod that goes forward to run the side gear that is for elevator. And then we got the standard aileron movement. And when I did the cockpit mock-up, I set up one of these and I went, oh, look at that. That works pretty good. I can have it over to the side. And it's, I, I keep myself out of the way of it. It'll be good. Well, that's where I went wrong. Just learned uh, as we went forward here that this is going to be a bit of a problem. You're saying, hey, I, I thought you already went out and did ground testing. And uh, didn't you find the problem then? And really, the problem only shows up when you have the suspension harness on and the lift harness and you're up in the cockpit. And let me show you what it is here. Okay, so once I get my feet up in here, and now you see the problem. The push rod for the elevator runs into my leg. Unless I'm sitting over here on the side, there just isn't room. Cage could have been wider, could have been 30 inches wide. That'd probably been better. Uh, but, well, it's too late now. So, in for a penny, in for a pound, I got to fix this one. Can I move the stick over? No, the control horns will hit the cage. I could mount the stick up higher, put this up higher so it would clear here. Oh, but then I have a cable in the way that's holding the pilot's cage together. So moving it up isn't much of an answer. So what I'm going to have to do here is I will have to move this push rod. The elevator push rod is going to have to move from the bottom here to up here. And this control horn will have to flip around 180 degrees. And I'm going to have to drive that control horn on top. And that will put the push rod up here where it will generally be out of the way. Or at least I can stay out of the way. And um, I'll have a little less leverage on the stick. So this stick might have to be a little bit longer, but we'll find out uh, in the future. Uh, but I, at least I need to modify this for extended flights where my feet are retracted. For the first few hops, probably okay the way that it is now. Okay, let's get the feet back down. So if I'm flying along seated like this, holding on, well, I can keep myself over to the side. I'm pretty much out of the way here. And heaven forbid I need this much control when I'm on the first few little short hops. If I need you know, 45 or 50 degrees of stick deflection, <laughs> I'm in trouble. Uh, hopefully I'll only be a few feet off the ground if that happens. So the other main control that we have here are, are the, is the flat handle. And that's right over here. It's just it's a convenient spot. And uh, up and around and up into the wing it goes. Uh, it comes out over here on some side cables control horns. Go watch the other videos to see how that works. Uh, the thing that we learned early on in the ground testing was this cleat that's over here, you probably can't see it. Let me see if I can get out of the way. This cleat here, uh, I used to have an open cleat. And if you pulled the rope out, well, it fell forward. And the handle would be way up there where you can't reach it. You're, you're like, oh, I can't reach the flap handle. Flap handle is kind of critical, not just for landing, but for maneuvering in flight. These flaps are actually used for pitch trim. You can go watch my other videos on that. So I, I had to install a captive uh, uh, cleat here where the rope can't fall out. Now that's the kind of thing that when you're working on a CAD model, you wouldn't think of in a million years. It's like, oh, yeah, it could fall out of there, it could fall forward. I, oh, where can I reach? Well, I can't reach that far. I, I got problems. Uh, and, and it's just, you're sitting at a bench, you're staring at a computer screen, you never think of that. Get in the cockpit, play with it once, it falls, and you go, uh-oh, I got a problem. And it takes about five minutes to find out what the true nature of the human machine interface is, uh, the reality of it. And then you can solve that problem. I put in a captive cleat. Um, now, here, here's another thing about keeping it simple. You could have a pulley here. You can mount a pulley on top of this cross member. The rope goes in, around the pulley, up it goes. Got to have a mount for the pulley. Got to have a pulley. Got to have bearings in the pulley. It's a standard system, but it's got more parts, more moving parts. I like simple. I said, hey, I got a tube that's round. Pulleys are round. Huh. This tube doesn't rotate though. Oh, I could slide a tube over it and the tube over the tube could rotate and I could build my cross tube into a pulley. Well, I was a little late for that because it's all glued together already. And then it dawned on me, I says, I, I just, this rope, this nylon rope, really slippery. I just need something slippery on the other surface. So what I did is I wrapped Teflon tape 
around uh, this cross member. And it's not a solution that lasts for years and years and years, but you know, most people don't fly in the winter time. Uh, they've got some weekends, they just cut this tape off, put new tape on. So all I needed was to create a couple of guides for the rope to make sure it didn't go this way or the other way. And uh, it's very simple, a couple of graphite plates and a little piece of plywood to go around the curve. And there we go, that, that's the pulley. And this is really slippery, works great. And you know what? The bearing will never fail. The pulley will never bind. There's nothing in here for the rope to catch on. It's really simple. No moving parts. Lightweight. And you know what? When I was designing the cockpit, when I did the cockpit mock-up, that never crossed my mind. Not once. What was in my mind was pulley all of the way. In fact, I thought of two pulleys. Pulley here and a pulley up at the wing. And what turns out is I have guide tubes up in the wing. I have uh, plastic tubes inside of aluminum tubing. Uh, here's the aluminum tubing here. Here's the plastic coming out. There's no pulley up there. It just slides through the plastic tubes, and, and the aluminum tubes provide a mounting system for the slippery plastic tubes. So within the whole flap system, the only thing that really moves is the rope and the control horns for the flaps. And the rest of it, no moving parts. And if we need to do maintenance, we got a little... Uh, uh, U hook here, or a, a, a carabiner, a U carabiner, and we could just unscrew that, disconnect the cables, and take the system apart. So simple, straightforward, and uh, easy to maintain, lightweight. Now, uh, another thing about human factors, it's really bad to distract the pilot. He needs to concentrate on flying. So you don't want a bunch of junk up here if you can avoid it. Blocks his view, distracts him. Uh, you know, and it's bad enough we start sticking instruments up here. Oh, you got GPS with a map. Oh, look at how far I've gone on the map. Oh, when you crash into somebody else in the thermal. Uh, so the fewer distractions, the better. Uh, so I've tried to keep the front view very clear. I'm using cables instead of struts. That's how I ended up with a tail boom. I didn't have a tail boom originally. This was going to be struts up here. Uh, but I really wanted to get all of that junk out of the pilot's view. And uh, somewhere in here, I might be able to, uh, I'll try to put up a picture of what the forward view out of the Swift is, and you'll see what I'm trying to avoid. Not that they're a bad solution, it's just I'm trying to improve on a previous design. So that required a tail boom so that I could have opposing cables. Now these cables, front and rear, no different than a standard hang glider. We got a triangle bar, and we got cables that go to the nose, and cables that go to the tail boom. So it's kind of a marrying of the two uh, systems. Cables are very reliable. Uh, super strong for their weight. It's a really good answer. And uh, a home builder can do cables on his own. You don't need to go out and have fancy aluminum fittings machine uh, to fit in your struts. So uh, that's why I'm on a cable solution. Clears up the view, keeps the clutter out of the way of the pilot. Some pilot wants to come in here and put in a whole instrument deck and distract himself. That's up to him. Uh, so let me get back in the position here normal flying position. So here we are. I got flaps over here on my left hand, which I can deploy easily. I got the stick here. And when I'm on toe, look, I just reach up. It's a natural reach position. You may not be able to see it in the video, but I got the release ball right here. Now that wasn't the first position for the release ball. It was over here and over there and then over there. And now it's here. And now it's in the right spot. So it took a few shots to figure it out. But okay, I'm flying right here. My hand's here. I can pull it and release, and when I'm flying normally, that's basically outside of my peripheral vision, and the dangling ball of the release is not going to annoy me or distract me. And I solved the pulley problem the same way that I did down here. I leveraged uh, the no moving parts slippery tape, and I built a, a little round thing here. Uh, you can't see it, a little fitting, and it bolts onto the pilot suspension system, and uh, that is the uh, 90 degree turn for the uh, toe release. Uh, pull knob. Uh, so, very simple, few moving parts. One moving part, the rope, and that goes up to uh, the release mechanism up front. So, and the rest of this is, I like to have a cockpit that's intimate, where you feel that you're integrated with the aircraft. Uh, when you achieve that feeling, um, I think it's easier to pilot the aircraft. If you're lost in the cockpit, or the cockpit is uh, not amenable to uh, how humans feel when they're in it, 
it's a harder aircraft to fly. I've flown dozens and dozens and dozens of different types of aircraft. And, and I've been in the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and, you know, surprisingly, and I'll pull my feet back for this little story. Surprisingly, the largest aircraft, certainly the largest wood, wood aircraft ever built, biggest wingspan, uh, the uh, Howard Hughes's H-1 Hercules, also known as the Spruce Goose, um, has an amazing cockpit. I'll put up a picture here. I was uh, graced one day with the opportunity to go in the cockpit and sit down and see what it was like. And let me tell you, behind the pilot seat, that deck, the cockpit deck, is about the size of a ballroom. You could hold a huge party in there with dozens of people dancing around and having drinks. It's gigantic. Uh, and I was shocked by it. I stood there and I looked around and went, wow, it's huge. I mean, I've been in a 747 cockpit, sat down there. That cockpit doesn't hold a candle to the H1. H1 is just huge. Yet, I slipped into the seat, right where Howard Hughes sat when he flew it. Got to put on a simulated hat like his. And the first thing I realized was, it was probably one of the most intimate cockpits I'd ever been in. It's not simple by any means. There's a load of controls. But they're all within arm's reach. And they're all right where you'd expect them to be. Where you would look most often is the stuff you want to see most often. And the stuff you want to see less often, further away. Stuff you uh, would want to see when you're looking straight ahead is there and down and so forth. That's not something that anybody designed in any program. I know that Howard Hughes was a, a massive uh, micromanager. And he spent countless hours in that cockpit uh, needling his engineers to move this and change that and put it over there. But the end result is amazing. That is one of the most intimate cockpits I've ever been in. And uh, I wish it were a flying aircraft so people could have the experience of what it's like to run an aircraft of that size. You, you, you have no sense of the size of that aircraft when you're in the cockpit. You feel like you're flying any other plane. Uh, yet you're sitting in this gigantic behemoth of Douglas fir or whatever it is that they built it of. Um, so uh, a very important lesson learned is that the intimacy of the cockpit, which I believe is critical to being able to pilot that aircraft uh, gracefully, uh, is more than just mere, you gotta be able to sit down and go, oh, I like that cockpit. Now this one that I'm sitting in right now, I pretty much have that feeling, but I wish it were about four inches wider. And I'm sure there's some people much bigger than me that would say, well, I'd like it about six inches wider. I probably should have run the cockpit out the full width of this center section, all the way out to the 30 inches. Uh, but there were some reasons why I didn't do that that have to do with structure that's inside the wing. And uh, with a little bit of work, I could redesign that, and I could uh, probably build a new pilot's cage and modify this center section and get a little bit more width. But why go to all that work if I'm not even sure the aircraft's going to fly properly? This is good enough for now. My buddy Bob complains about, oh yeah, yeah, I can't use safety pins for a connector here. You've got to have the circle clip and feed it through that. I know, I know, I know. That's what you need for regular flight safety. But we're in ground testing, so it's good enough for now. Uh, and that's how I approach this whole thing. And little by little, we'll jack this thing up to uh, it's good enough for now and way off into the future. We'll get there eventually.